Reflecting on the early days, back in the beginning of medical cannabis, uh, it really was, uh, uh, we just decided we were going to do whatever it took to get the job done. I remember we circulated petitions and we talked to lawmakers, we talked to the media, uh, sometimes well and sometimes not. Uh, we talked to our friends and our loved ones, uh, and, and there were even acts of uh, civil disobedience. Uh, I got arrested blockading the uh, federal courthouse in Sacramento because Brian Eppes was going to jail, and uh, we decided if he was going to jail, we were going to jail too. And so a string of us sat there and, and shut down the courthouse. There was another kind of civil disobedience that we were involved in uh, back in those early days, and that is uh, opening patients associations. Uh, we just set about to provide medical cannabis, knowing full well it was illegal, and we were going to do it anyway. And uh, some of us thought, oh, well, you know, we'll get busted and we'll go fight the good fight in court. Uh, but there was this spirit of doing whatever it took to make it happen. Uh, and that's really, I think, what it takes to take a grassroots movement, something that's illegal, that's stigmatized, that's marginalized, and to push it forward. And so uh, uh, from that's been going on since the beginning of this movement, from the 1970s when the Controlled Substances Act was adopted and cannabis was misclassified and Schedule One for political purposes, left there and sort of abandoned in Schedule One. And brave patients like Robert Randall took on the federal government in court uh, uh, to help bring medical cannabis into the IND program. There was grassroots organizing all over the nation. People were working towards medical cannabis reform. Uh, we had state propositions uh, starting in California and Arizona, and now there are 18 states in the district with medical cannabis. Uh, and now we, we've all come to the point where there's even federal legislation pending, uh, H.R. 710 by Sam Farr and H.R. 689 by Blumenhauer. Important bills. And when we look at whatever it takes, uh, we're going to have to work hard to adopt this legislation and to push it forward. That means we're going to have to have some time and some effort in it, uh, responding to the email blast, visiting lawmakers in support of the legislation, organizing the communities, writing to the media, all of that nuts and bolts activism that I, I think sometimes people think, oh, that's simple stuff, somebody else will handle it. It's really you in this room. You're the ones who will be writing the op-eds. You're the ones who will be visiting the district offices in your home states. Uh, the one, you'll be the ones responding to reports phone calls in every city and county across the country and so we need uh, that participation that time and that effort uh, ongoing all, we, we, this goes all the way back to 1970 or, or to 1937 depending on where you want to start and we that time is still important to be invested to make it happen we also need the, the financial resources of the community and thank you for everyone who joined ASA today that helps make this happen and we need unity, and that's one of the reasons I'm so happy this is a unity conference, is because we have uh, 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 opportunity to be effective when we're acting in concert, which doesn't mean we always agree, that's not the definition of unity, but that we always cooperate. And so I, I think there's a spirit of cooperation in this movement that's been absent for a long time, and I'm so happy to see so many people gathered together and deciding to do whatever it takes to get medical cannabis legal at the federal level. And we're gonna start doing that on Monday. We figured I'd start only because um, Alice O'Leary couldn't be here, so I'm just stepping in for Alice, Bob Randall's wife, but... Yay, Yay Alice! <laughs> and Bob, as if anybody doesn't know, he is the father of, of the medical cannabis movement. Yes. Uh, he started everything. Uh, unfortunately, we lost him in 2001. There's Bob, funny sort of fella, good sense of humor. <laughs> Very articulate, this man. Uh, we couldn't have picked for a better spokesperson if we tried. But Robert's fame is the fact that he was the first individual uh, arrested, busted for cannabis, and was able to have a legitimate defense. This is, and that's just showing him after he won. Um, but uh, for those of you who know, don't know, Bob got, you know, using the marijuana for his glaucoma. He was, uh, age 24 diagnosed with glaucoma, told that he would probably be blind by the age of 30. And he just discovered, <coughs> it's not that he just discovered cannabis, but <laughs> um, trying it later in his life, um, after getting glaucoma, 
it was that use of, of, of cannabis that all of a sudden the halos around his eyes, when he would look out at street lights and see these halos around the lights and that, his sight was clearing and he just kind of thought, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> but he tried it again and pretty soon he realized, you know, like, hmm, cannabis, eyesight, better. <laughs> Um, so he realized it, it worked well. Didn't tell his physicians right away, um, but he, he got busted. Uh, he and Alice came back from a trip and uh, came back to their DC apartment where they had grown some plants in the back, on their back, back balcony, and when he got home, he says, found a little search warrant in the door, or a, an, an arrest warrant, you know, you're under arrest, please turn yourself in for growing the plants. So he had a long battle to fight with that. <laughs> That caused a lot of uproar. Bob was on, you know, you name it, the TV shows did pick it up. This was big news back then. Um, and he won the case. A, a law firm, Stepto and Johnson. So it was the U.S. versus Randall in, in a big case, and he set up the medical necessity defense. It's all written up, uh, but the point being, it's the same man. I, if without the use of this cannabis, I would go blind. Any rational person would do the same. Uh, you know, the use of, of cannabis is much less harm to society than him going blind. This is one of the decisions. It's a, it's a big decision, but uh, from the judge, the evil he sought to prevent blindness is greater than that he performed to accomplish it, growing marijuana. The judge got it. So in 1979, going on with his legal leg legacy, he did sue the federal government after his supplies of medical marijuana were terminated. As I said, Steptoe and Johnson represented him. The out-of-court settlement assured him that he would, that his medicine, they established the Compassionate IND program. That's the Compassionate Investigational New Drug Program. The drug's not out there. It's not ready for, for you to go to the drugstore and get this medication. It's still under studies. They put a little compassionate there, um, but saying that he would be able to get this supply, and that meant that he would get it through NIDA, who grows it in Mississippi. It's the only source of legal marijuana in the, state, in the United States. Um, and that paved his way for the rest. Now, in the audience we have Elvie. Could you stand up? and this has meant um, her sight as well. Uh, other patients, Irv Rosenfeld's not here, but he's the, now the longest uh, p surviving patient. Um, he's down in Florida. Kenny and Barbara Jenks, actually a little story about Kenny and Barbara Jenks is, is they kind of got patients out of time, a little boost, I guess you could say, but Kenny was an HIV, uh, excuse me, a hemophiliac patient living in Florida, and with all the blood transfusions, um, contracted HIV, Without realizing it, he then infected his wife. So this young couple, uh, AIDS patients, very sick, never did drugs. Uh, and, and what ended up happening was they, uh, the support group suggested, people in the support group suggested, you might want to try cannabis. It'll really help. <laughs> you get through the medications you have to take, et cetera. So Kenny tried. Um, Barbara was still too afraid. Kenny tried it. And he felt better right away and was able to help her. Often they had their beds with a garbage can on either side, just, you know, losing whatever they took in. But he was able to kind of nurse her. She started taking it. Long story short, they got busted. They eventually got into the program. Um, and and uh, Kenny was quite outspoken in the AIDS community then about telling them about patients. Continuing with Bob's legacy, though. So, uh, Bob and Alice worked tirelessly with Normal, but they assisted in getting 34 states with medical cannabis laws. So when we say Prop 215 in California, that's kind of the modern um, version of, of making it available. But when these states did it, they had access through NIDA to get the marijuana. So th those old laws were written where doctors could prescribe it because they could prescribe it. They could get the cannabis from the, from the federal government. And often some of these states just did big studies. New Mexico, they had the Lynn Pearson uh, medical act, and uh, that's a fellow who died of cancer before the, uh, they got that law passed. But there were some laws, and that started uh, research. Um, and then in 1981, they drafted the first legislation. So now get this. This is back in 81, four co-sponsors, one of them including Newt Gingrich, <laughs> um, to help with this. They got up to you know, the 10, uh, 110 co-sponsors of the bill. 
This was just, uh, Alice threw this uh, slide in because that's signed by Newt Gingrich, basically saying to Bob, you know, thanks for your help in, in trying to get this bill passed. Then in 1991, ACT, uh, Bob had formed ACT, the Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics, to help people understand about the IND access and how they too could get cannabis. He had cannabis from the federal government. There's something wrong with this picture. If I get it, why can't anybody else get it too? So they, they uh, expanded a little and they, and they opened up MARS, which is the Medical AIDS Research um, Service. And that was one that Kenny, and, uh, Kenny really took hold of um, and, and was going around to the uh, different places. And what they did is they developed the protocol. So if a, a patient with AIDS uh, wanted to try to get into the program, he could give this packet of paper to his physician. So the physician just had to fill in some blanks specific to that patient and then send it into the government. It made it really easy. But, so what happened is, it, in the time frame, by 1990, uh, Normal had a conference in which we, and, and I was on the board at the time, we put the first five legal patients together. Bob ran a panel with the other four patients, um, Corinne Millette, Irv Rosenfeld, Albie Masika, and George McMahon, um, of which uh, Corinne and Bob are now deceased. Uh, but they were on, and C-SPAN picked it up, and so it got covered across the country. Um, and, and normal literally got calls, thousands of calls started coming in about patients who saw real people who got cannabis from the federal government, how do I do it? And with his program of making it easier for patients, they also had Palm, which is the paralyzed Americans for legal cannabis, I think. But it was working with, the, with people with spinal cord injuries to, to get cannabis, another thing, a protocol. But the government did get flooded. They got hundreds of, of um, applications for this, and so they closed the program. Their, uh, their answer was, well, let's just close the program. And that ended that legal access for patients to cannabis. At the time, there were 12 to 15 patients who got cannabis, 30-some <laughs> who were told they would get it, but didn't get it yet, and then hundreds were waiting. And the government just said, we're not going to look at those. Those people that we promised to get cannabis, you're not going to get it. And you 12, 15, you'll continue to get it. Um, like I said, that, so that was 92 when they closed the program. But you can read it all and learn a lot of history from, again, the father of the medical cannabis movement. I encourage anybody to get this book. It's, it's well written, a uh, story more or less uh, narrated by, by Bob, but Alice and Bob worked on this together. A 1998 book, um, but marijuana treatment. It's an excellent book. There's Bob, and I just left this. That's Alice, who couldn't be here uh, in the Santa Barbara conference with us. And if anyone does have any, uh, want to know more about Bob, anything, by all means, this is Alice's contact. She does want to share that with you. Um, and, and what happened? That was 1992 when they closed the program. By 1995, there were only eight of those patients left alive. And that, Bob and Alice's work more or less spawned patients out of time. He was getting very ill. They'd moved to Florida, retiring, slowing down, and more or less kind of passed the mantle to patients out of time to continue pushing the, the idea about educating and helping patients get access to this. But again, it all started with Bob. And uh, what can we say, but <laughs> thank you, Bob. I first, I want to, it's a delight to be here, and I'm so grateful and honored to be um, sharing this stage with so many incredible activists and so much history. And um, I'm, you know, I, all, so many people in this room have risked a great deal. You know, this is the mainstreaming of marijuana, of cannabis, and um, you know, as we do that, we think about, I'm thinking about how many people have 
been challenged and threatened, careers have been threatened, and, and how their, our freedom, our health, even incarceration, and especially I want to thank, and I recall the patients, because really it's that personal suffering of patients that have brought all of us into this room. We're here um, today because we're kind of convening a, um, a communion of sorts of scientists and patients and academics, activists, of physicians and politicos, of pharma folks, because that kind of takes the edge off, the fo adding the folks to big pharma, big pharma folks, I think it's kind of nice, and of filmmakers. Some of us are creating ties and some of us are distancing ourselves from one another. And it's interesting to have watched this over the last 20 years. But each of us have something to gain, and each of us have a great deal to learn, to understand, and to offer for the future of cannabis. It's really the most interesting time. So in the last 20 years that I've been doing this work with my, um, with my ex-husband and co-founder, Mike Corral, has provided extraordinary opportunities and as many activists, at least many that I know, were propelled into a kind of work by uh, necessity. So the necessity defense even becomes more important when you're challenged. And uh, in 1973, I was in a very strange automobile accident with an airplane in the desert. You know, I think about that almost 40 years ago. And... Um, I think about what, how do, what, dest what brings you? My mother, I was talking about destiny with my mom, and she said, well, you know, it's choice, not chance, that determines our destinies. And that you get an opportunity uh, propel to be propelled into one of the most important civil liberties movements of our time is just really, really remarkable. It gives us a chance to do something that's not only meaningful to ourselves because of need, but that we can change the lives of other human beings. And what's so important about that is that it remains an issue of civil liberty, of access, of access, no matter what it turns into, no matter who sells it to us for how much money they make, that, that's irrelevant. That we as individuals have an, and remain, uh, remain access remains with us to a botanic, to something that grows on the planet and knows how to be a plant. It knows how to do its, its work. I, you know, this 20 years of work with WAM has provided this opportunity that, that's, as the longest running medical marijuana organization, or collective in the nation, it's a community-based organization where all kinds of people, patients as diverse as, as all of us in this room come together. And <clears throat> I can reflect on these years, and it's sobering to think about how many of our friends have died and how broadly this, this movement touches lives and how incredible, uh, as an activist, it's been to engage in, this, in the civil disobedience, the deliberate violation of law for a vital social purpose. Sometimes we act knowing full well that the odds are against us, and we do so not to exercise temerity, but to appeal to a higher principle than the law defines. In the beginning of this movement, and not the, can you, uh, what, I, what I'm gonna do instead of going through all this history is just pop up a couple of slides and you guys can read if you want. <laughs> and so, cause it's kind of, it's kind of boring. Um, so, you know, it, in the beginning, <clears throat> of this movement, our, our, our civil disobedience acts um, illustrated our struggle to awaken America. But so much has changed since then. Marijuana is referenced <clears throat> and nuanced everywhere. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, <clears throat> excuse me, as a matter of fact, a week or so ago, I was interviewed by the New York Times. This is hilarious, this is hilarious to me. In the style section, <clears throat> Yes, about the etiquette of using marijuana. <laughs> this, the mainstreaming of cannabis. So I was like, this is, you're really calling me, does it matter how I dress? No, it didn't. Um, <laughs> but still, it wasn't always like this. Years of effort to create access 
has led me from political activist to humanist. Nearly 400 WAM members, friends of mine, family, have died since the inception of WAM in 1993. That's more than one a month. And I've had the very good fortune and the honor to be invited to the bedside of many. It's a remarkable experience and has changed me. The intimacy that exists in our small collective, because we have weekly meetings and we grow all of our medicine together, those people that can, has wheelchair accessibility. But that intimacy gives us an opportunity in our small, small collective to connect people with each other. And that intimacy gives way to explore the desires that arise and fall away from us when facing a long-term illness and that suffering and death comes upon us. So almost every one of our members wants to die at home, except for two. Everyone wanted to be at home. So what we do is we exact their wishes. We design a process or a, a path that's dictated by patients to us. And then we carry out what they want, whatever that is. And you know, one man's normality is another woman's bizarre behavior, so. <laughs> So on the eve of the DEA raid, which was in 2002 at our home, my friend and WAM board chair, Suzanne File and I were stay, stayed up late until about 3 in the morning, and we were coming up with a plan, designing the plan for Raha Kudo, our sister nonprofit organization. Raha Kudo, it's the Design for Dying project. And that we took from Tim Leary, a book that he wrote when he was dying. Um, and it, it was a telling moment, the morning at 7 a.m. is when DEA came, you know, the boots stomping on the deck, they're not very quiet. Um, and uh, so at least we knew it wasn't a thief. So, um, but, but that, that, yeah, right? <laughs> so what came out of that, you know, out of that night, that very telling moment where, you know, we're on the, it's kind of a very, it's, it's, it's an amazing concept to be thinking that you're planning to build something that can, can serve the very the most ill and the and and disenfranchised of our population, and then to be arrested by the DEA for doing it. But it, it mobilized our community. Um, it mobilized our our organization. Many of our members uh, went and locked the DEA in. We were taken away to a holding um, cell in San Jose, and our members kind of bargained for our release. And it was a really wonderful moment where people in wheelchairs and walkers and very, very ill friends stood off the DEA and locked them in behind the gate. As a matter of fact, I um, yeah. Amazing, aren't they? Isn't that cool? Yeah, you know, because when you're facing formidable illness, and I don't have to tell many of you when you're facing death, the government pales. Right? The government pales because you've already experienced hardship and suffering, and the prison that surrounds illness. <clears throat> so back in the garden, patients and caregivers convene, and we work, and we eat, and we play music, and we hang out, and we spend the night, and have bonfires, and garden blessings, and whatever people really want to do. And there's something for everyone to do. And just in case you're in a wheelchair, there's something for you to do, too. We have wheelchair-accessible garden. And since since WAM's inception, it's just been bounty, bounty, bounty. Even in the wake of loss of arrests, I've been arrested three times. Um, even in the wake of those, it's always been a greater understanding, a bigger community that, that's grown, and really a response by what's this nor the normalcy and the mainstreaming that I'm, really this medicine has become. I thank you for taking the time to listen. My name is Andrew D'Angelo, and in addition to being the younger brother of Steve D'Angelo, which is a hell of a job, let me tell you, I'm also general manager and one of the founders of Harborside Health Center. 
Thank you. Steve was actually supposed to be up here speaking with all of you today, but he got the flu bug and couldn't make the trip. And you know that Steve has to be pretty sick to pass up on a speaking gig. Uh, he did pitch Steph on getting a satellite truck to beam his image 3,000 miles to all of you today, uh, but negotiations broke down over who would pay for that. Isn't that, it always breaks down over who will pay for it, isn't it? He even had his uh, hat and tie picked out. But uh, since I was coming to the conference anyway, it was decided that I'll just fill in for him. So I'm happy to be with all of you this morning. One of the other things that I do for Harborside Health Center is make videos. And since today's panel is all about resistance, I thought I'd take a couple minutes and show you our latest effort. There was once a land called NorCal, amongst the cannabis trees, where the folk that smoked their flowers lived a happy life in peace. But an ancient law dictated that all cannabis is bad, so the G-men confiscated every flower that they had. Then the people got together and proclaimed, it is our will that this flower still be legal for the dying and the ill. On the hill, Mr. Obama, who presides over the land, heard the voices of the people and replied to their demand. Under my administration, you may use your medication as long as you always follow every local regulation. And so it was with this promise that the flower once more bloomed and the sick people would use it, unaware of looming doom. Twas the hog, U.S. attorney, who corrupted with her power would set out to bring destruction to every last cannabis flower. She pretended she was only deeply invested in the law, but she cut from every garden every flower that she saw. It's not working fast enough, muttered the hog in frustration. We mustn't stop until we reach absolute eradication. Get the dispensary owners and try to get their suppliers. If they say you have no reason, make one up and call them liars. Bring the operators before me from every corner of town. I will come up with a reason to one by one shut them down. So they brought the vapor room and the divinity tree from the heart of San Francisco where the movement came to be. Many people really need us, both the operators pled. Their objections didn't matter. She just said, off with their head. The head of Oaksterdam College, a man ahead of his time, had once made a proposition that cannabis not be a crime. All his work was not rewarded, and he was punished instead, when the hog in fuming fury simply yelled, off with his head. And now the hog is facing her largest and loudest dissenter. They have brought into her courtroom the Harborside Health Center. In six years, a hundred thousand patients walked through their doors. Harborside was also featured in the TV show Weed Wars. Even government officials say to close it would be a pity. After all, the businesses paying lots of taxes to the city. When the hog was asked the question why she's after Harborside, she just grinned and cleared her throat and said this when she replied. <clears throat> there is no reason to close them from everything I've read, but they're too large to be trusted. So I say, off with their head. <gasps> Everyone gasped and surprised. She had dropped her pretenses. And when they saw her intentions, the people came to their senses. We cannot stand this abuse, yelled a voice in the crowd. This is America, land of the free, and this nonsense not allowed. When will President Obama finally take a position? He could end this if he wants to by executive decision. Um, everyone, you can go to YouTube slash Harborside Health and you can share it with everybody and view it and download it and put it on your networks and get it out there. We already have over 10,000 views, so we're really excited about it. And I must say, whoever did the voiceover did a superb job. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny, a lot of people after they see the video, they come up to us and they say, you guys are crazy. What are you doing? You're just going to piss her off and she's going to come bust you. 
You didn't even pronounce her name right. My response is always, hog rhymes better than head. So that's why we did that. And the fact is, Steve and I and our collective, we're not afraid to stand up to the feds. We're not afraid to stand up for our patients. And we're not afraid to use humor and to see our struggles through the eyes of a child. That is part of what cannabis teaches us. That is part of the healing properties of the plant. So a lot of people are probably wondering how our legal fight with the feds is going. So I'll take a minute very quickly to update you and give you the narrative. It's a very complex narrative, so I've simplified it. I've left some things out and I've some of these events overlap, but uh, I will try my best to, to make it understandable. On July 9th of last year, uh, both our locations in, Har in Oakland and San Jose were served by the U.S. Attorney Melinda Haig with forfeiture notices. Shortly thereafter, our landlords, under tremendous pressure from the feds, uh, they went into the state of California landlord tenant court and tried to evict us, claiming that we were doing illegal activity. Our brilliant attorney, Henry Wykowski, <laughs> Henry filed a motion to quash the eviction based on the fact that our lease clearly stated that we were a medical cannabis dispensary, our lease clearly stated what we were doing, and distributing medical can cannabis was valid under state law. The judge agreed and threw out the eviction. Yeah. Then the feds pressured the landlords to file a motion in federal court to stop all distribution of cannabis at our facilities immediately based on violation of the Controlled Substance Act. Well, Henry did his magic again, and he submitted a brief. We argued in front of the judge that the landlord should not be granted this motion because they knew what we were doing for six years. They had no problem taking our rent all that time and they do not have the ability to enforce the Controlled Substances Act. The judge agreed, and the motion was thrown out. Now, we still have to go through a trial on the merits of the case. And our next hearing is March 14th, and this is something they call a, a conference hearing, and it's largely procedural where there'll be discussing in front of the judge both sides, what the schedule of the case will be, when discovery will be taken, jury selection, when motions will be filed. A schedule, if you will. And that takes place on March 14th. And then we go to trial in front of a Bay Area jury. <laughs> Steve and Henry and I, and probably all of you, are confident that when we get up in front of that Bay Area jury and we present our case and the case of our patients, we will prevail again. <laughs> then everybody in this movement will have a precedent in federal court to beat back these brutal foreclosures, to keep our facilities open, and to keep providing safe access to this medicine. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to win. We are going to win, and all of you are going to win. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Andrew. I want to introduce uh, one more panelist who wasn't here at the start, uh, Joseph Casayas, uh, who has been fighting for his rights to use medical cannabis. Uh, uh, was terminated from Walmart uh, for that use, for legal medical use of cannabis. And so I want to uh, invite Joseph to come on up. Hello, how is everyone doing today? I would first like to thank the individuals who made it possible for me to be here. And I would also like to thank them for the opportunity to speak in front of you all today. Uh, I'm going to give you some information about uh, my type of cancer, and then I'm going to give you in detail what led up to my termination from Walmart. Uh, A little bit of background about my cancer. Um, my cancer, the type of cancer I have is called nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, which is the same type of cancer that took the life of baseball of rape, Babe Ruth. I was diagnosed at the age of 17 with this cancer. I had a brain tumor when first diagnosed, and it was the size of a softball. Before I got sick with cancer, I weighed about 210 pounds on average. When I was diagnosed, I went down to skin and bones, literally. You can see every single bone in my body. I had massive bleeding out of my nostrils, along with severe headaches and complete loss of appetite. I had massive amounts of chemo, chemo and radiation treatments, along with having a feeding tube placed in my stomach. The doctors discovered the tumor had eaten through my bone marrow in my neck and it was inoperable. I have been a cancer patient for 13 years. But from the treatments I received, <clears throat> it's also caused other complications, like the shrinking of my jaw, which I can only open my mouth to 11 centimeters. My voice has become distorted, which is why it's hard for people to understand me when I'm talking. I deal with chronic pain on a daily basis in my head, neck, throat, and back. I still have problems with my appetite and numbness in the entire left side of my body. Despite all these things, I wanted to live a normal life as possible. In 2008, 63% of Michigan voters voted for the Medical Marijuana Act, which my oncologist, who has treated me my entire time with cancer and chemo and radiation, thought that I would benefit from using the medical marijuana, which has helped me a great deal. My pain, my appetite on the other basis is more tolerable. I may want to eat more only when I smoke. I can only eat when I smoke. <coughs> I went for Walmart for five years. I was terminated for a failed urine test for medical marijuana. On the night I was injured and leading up to my termination, from Walmart. This is what happened. I went into work about 4 p.m., which is when my shift starts. My job was to make sure the grocery and general merchandise trucks on both sides of the store were unloaded and broken down into departments or aisles. I ran out and placed each in their department or aisles by 10 p.m. for their shift to come in and slack them. On this night, we had two trucks. One of the general, men, general merchandise was sold at about 5,000 pieces. And on the first side, there were two trucks, which sold at 2,000 pieces. My team, which I was the manager of, was short handed. We had four people. And the general merchandise trucks are unloaded by hand by individual pieces. <coughs> the manager gave us help for, these, for, for those employees and was not in their everyday job. So it was not easy for them to do. But we were very grateful for the help anyhow. We had one of the trucks trying to get the product to the floor. When we were behind, it was almost 10 p.m. Time for third shift to come in. My team and I were hard, trying very hard to get the pallets and freight and carts out to the floor. I had a manager hitting on me. Come on, get it done, get it done, we need this done. <coughs> the help that we had had already went home, their shift ended. 
Why can't we know we're doing all that we could to get our work done? I took a cart of canned goods that was pushing it across the store. The cart was severely overspent on lack of room in the back room while we were unloading the trucks. And it had a bad wheel. While trying to steer this cart, I spent awkwardly and my knee popped. I could not put pressure on it. So I sat down on a nearby bench in the clothing area. I felt an associate went and got a manager. I felt an accident report. And they sent me home that evening. I returned the next day for work and still could not put much pressure or weight on my knee. We had a small shop that night. So after my team and I got unloaded to unload the truck, a manager came and asked me if they could take me to the ER to have my knee looked at. So I agreed, given the circumstance that I still couldn't it hurt and I couldn't put much weight on it. The manager took me to the ER. I went back to the room in the ER, and a person from the lab was there to take my urine sample. They would not talk to me until they took my urine sample. He asked to their lab doctor from Arkansas. <laughs> While I waited, and finally, uh, the human resource manager told me to clock in and get to work. So I did. I finally got a call from that doctor, and he asked me if I took Marino. And I said, no, I do not take Marino. I'm a medical marijuana patient, and that I have a current issue from the state of Michigan. The doctor then stated that I would have to take that issue up with Walmart. So then I ended the call, went into the office to speak with the manager about the conversation with the doctor. I showed my manager my card, and told, he told me to call on break so he could call and speak with the store manager who had already left for the day. So I did. I went and came back. The manager told me he spoke with the store manager. And all I would need to do was for them to get a copy of my medical marijuana card. And then I had nothing to worry about. I would not be fired. I would have nothing to worry about. <coughs> so I left them to take a copy of my card. I worked the next day. Then I had the next two days off. And I came back to work. It was two days to, until next evening. I went to the back of the store to start working. My store manager came back and asked me, to come into the office that he would like to speak with me. So I did. We got into the office, and there was another manager, and also the loss prevention manager. I walked in, my store manager told me to sit down, which I did. And then he proceeded to tell me that he was firing me because of a failed drug test. My store manager said that he knew that I had a car, but we do not accept it. I said nothing. He then left the office, and the other managers walked through my exit interview. After getting the legal representation, I took the issue to state court. And then Walmart's legal representation took it, picked it up, and took it to a federal court in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on the grounds that my representation illegally named the store manager in the lawsuit. I lost the case in federal court on that ground. And that the MMA did not staff employees from firing an employee for a failed drug screening. My representation filed an appeal, and we went to the 6th District Court in Cincinnati, Ohio. I lost that case in front of a panel of three judges on a two-to-one vote during my time at Walmart. In April, in April 2008, I received an employee of the month. In January 2009, which was seven months before I got fired, I received the award of Associate of the Year for the year 2008. And despite earning these accomplishments and praises from management and fellow workers, I was terminated from the use of medical marijuana. To me, Walmart was much more than a job or a paycheck. It was a way of life. I felt persons should not be judged by your example, but by the quality of their work. I also feel that if you are not under the influence of medical marijuana at work, when you are a medical marijuana patient, you should not lose your job. I feel this is discrimination against people who deal with illnesses and pain and their pain and pain in their lives. And if medical marijuana helps them, if medical marijuana helps them, they should not lose their job. I believe companies like Walmart 
that operate in medical marijuana states should follow the medical marijuana laws of those states. Because in my opinion, if they're running a business in the state, don't they have to apply for a state license to run that business in that state? And by applying for that state license and getting a state license, don't you have to apply by the state laws of that state? I'm not a federal, I'm not a federal, uh, a federal, I don't live in a federal country, I live in a state of Michigan. So I do understand that they have to follow state and federal laws. I understand that. But for, first, for people who have illnesses, for people who have problems because of treatments like chemo and radiation, and it makes their life almost as bad, uh, why fire them? Don't they go through enough? Does our economy need more unemployment potential? And why should innocent people who are sick or just trying to heal themselves and have a quality of life, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? But no, and I think I ask, I seek for change. I know my voice is not the best. But I'm determined to try to bring that change. I'm determined to do what I have to do. I thank you all for listening to my situation. I am grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. I can't thank you enough, and I hope that maybe I can bring a light to help make change for employment rights and medical marijuana patients. Uh, there are many, many battles that we've had to fight, uh, either uh, patients fighting for themselves or uh, uh, fighting uh, for other people, and that's that resistance and that uh, prolonged effort that's going to really ultimately turn the tide for medical cannabis. Uh, in the time we have remaining, I wanted to mention a fight uh, that I had the privilege to fight on behalf of somebody else who was in trouble for medical cannabis, and I hope it's an example of how individuals can engage in the grassroots campaign for medical cannabis using their body and their imagination and their time uh, to fight on behalf of others who are victims of, uh, of this war on medical cannabis patients. Uh, the patient that I had the privilege of uh, standing up for was a, a very soft-spoken, obscure man named Ed Rosenthal. <laughs> If you uh, uh, don't know who Ed Rosenthal is, he's the famous Ask Ed Rosenthal from High Times Magazine, who has a long and distinguished career in uh, uh, educating people about medical cannabis, growing medical cannabis, uh, fighting for medical cannabis. Uh, in that long career, I'm going to focus on what happened in 2002. This is actually a pivotal moment in the creation of the Americans for Safe Access campaign because in 2002, the DEA uh, raided the warehouse that Ed Rosenthal used to grow marijuana for city-sanctioned legal medical marijuana collectives and cooperatives in Oakland. Uh, and in fact, Ed was designated as drug, drug control officer by the city of Oakland and was uh, uh, cultivating marijuana for those programs. And they uh, raided his warehouse and then they came to his home early in the morning and kicked in the door. And uh, rumor has it that uh, when Ed came downstairs to see what the commotion was, he was completely naked. I don't know if that's true or not, but if you guys see Ed, you should ask Ed if that's true. So Ed went to trial. Ed went to trial in federal court, and uh, right now the conviction rate in federal court for medical cannabis is 100%. And so uh, uh, we knew that we were really up against uh, a wall here because uh, federal law is, uh, does not allow for medical cannabis. And uh, as you know, uh, medical cannabis patients in federal court are not allowed to raise state law or city sanction, the city deputization, or anything else about medical cannabis in federal court. Uh, we, we hope we're going to change that with the Truth and Trials Act this year. But until that happens, uh, uh, Ed was in the same position as the other defendants. No, no real defense to offer in federal court. And so we wanted to find a way 
uh, while his lawyers were fighting inside, that we could fight outside for Ed Rosenthal. And so what we uh, orchestrated, first of all, was a, a piece of political theater uh, for the courthouse. Now, if you go to the courthouse and you try to influence a jury, if you try to tell a jury, um, hey, acquit Ed Rosenthal, that's called jury tampering. You can go to jail for that. And in fact, uh, in the early days of our court support, uh, uh, one of our protesters was actually arrested for, for jury tampering, for, for doing exactly that, although very innocently. And so uh, we decided we would orchestrate a, uh, a theater for the jurors and for the lawyers and the judges as they came into the federal building every morning. And so on, on both sides of the federal building, we organized two separate protests. And the two never interacted with each other. It was as if we were completely separate uh, groups. One group uh, stood there all, all morning long holding a poster board with a, a green cross, uh, sorry, with a green leaf and a red cross on it, a medical marijuana logo, and they just stood there silently. And people must have thought, what in the world are these people doing out here with pot leaves? But they stood there, and then my group was a, a, a little bit further down the way on the other side of the courthouse, just standing there with tape on our mouths. By the way, if you're ever in a protest like this, do not put the tape straight on your face. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> However, we stood there with tape on our mouths, and so as people walked by, they're like, something about medical marijuana, something we can't talk about. What's happening at the courthouse today? And then some of those folks went into the jury selection room and were like, ah, oh, I see what's happening. It also made a wonderful moment for the media at the courthouse to come by and photograph all of us fools standing there in the cold with tape on our mouths and signs in our hands, basically saying nothing, but we hope communicating a lot. And so that was one of those uh, uh, moments where we could help uh, um, dramatize the issue for someone else uh, just by using our bodies. Now, we didn't know what effect this would have uh, or what effect any of the, the media work we, that Americans for Safe Access was doing around the case might have for the overall uh, uh, outcome of the case. As was expected, Ed Rosendahl was convicted uh, in 2000, I guess the, by then it was 2003, and he was convicted of growing marijuana, growing cannabis legally in the state of California. Uh, and there was a, a remarkable moment because after the uh, conviction, the jurors came out and uh, one of our uh, very first ACE employees, uh, Hillary McQuay, was standing in the hallway and she just reached out and grabbed one of the jurors and was like, wait a minute, I've got to talk to you. Because once the jury's dismissed, it's not jury tampering anymore. So they, del exactly. yeah, so they delivered the verdict. Uh, Hillary grabbed them and said, listen, we have to just know what in the world were you thinking. And one by one, we talked to as many jurors as we could find and, and they said that some of them thought there was something going on around medical cannabis, but they figured if it was important, somebody would have said something about it. The others said they were sure it was medical cannabis. They knew darn well it was, but when the judge took them back into the jury chambers after the trial to give them instructions, he very clearly said, this isn't about motives, it's not about what, uh, what you think about medical cannabis, it's not about uh, the state law. The, question, the only question for you to answer is, did this man break the federal law? And you have to do that. In fact, one juror said they were pretty sure they'd be in trouble if they didn't convict. One of the jurors was really confused about this. She actually went out and, and asked another lawyer for some advice. And uh, that lawyer said, of course you have to convict. So that was bad advice. What nobody will tell you when you're a juror is this, you may vote your conscience. And there is no penalty for voting your conscience. But the judge won't tell you that, and neither will a lawyer. So just know that. You can vote your conscience. And uh, uh, these jurors were uh, scandalized that they had been a, a party to a sham, to a, a sham, to a, a, a show trial, that they had been coerced, in a sense, into uh, convicting a man that they didn't believe was guilty of doing anything wrong. And so uh, what came out of this was what uh, is now known as the jury revolt, where eight members of that jury, and both of the alternates, stood up afterwards and said, this is wrong. And they went to press conferences. It was a great moment. We held press conferences for them to speak out. On the day that Ed Rosenthal was sentenced, uh, after this huge media uproar about the jury revolt, uh, those jurors sat right in the front row with Ed and his family, right up at the front of the courthouse, just to send the last message to the judge and say, this man should not be guilty. Now, as a matter of fact, Ed Rosenthal did ultimately win a new trial. Uh, ironically, he won a new trial because of jury misconduct. Uh, the, the judge, when they found out that the juror had consult, uh, consulted with an attorney outside the courtroom, that's uh, not allowed, and they had to dismiss the, the case because of that juror misconduct. And so that juror uh, inadvertently and unintentionally did sow the seeds that ultimately led for this initial overturning of Ed's case. <laughs> not that that's
that's good legal advice. Don't do that if you're on a jury, but it, it did work out in this time. And so what, uh, Ed uh, uh, said in the courtroom uh, with the jurors there, after this big media uh, uproar, it was all over the press. The national press loved this story of the jury revolt in medical marijuana. Uh, and uh, the, the judge in this case uh, sentenced Ed Rosenthal to one day in federal prison with credit for the time he already served on the day he got arrested. <laughs> So Ed Rosenthal, who was convicted of growing thousands and thousands of marijuana plants, uh, actually walked out of court on his sentencing day a free man, uh, done with his, his service. So uh, that's a really outstanding outcome. And the media message that came from the, the poster boards and the tape on the mouths and the jury revolt and just the quick thinking, frankly, from, from Hillary in the hallway that day in the courthouse really helped, uh, I believe, to influence that outcome. One of many factors that was influencing that lenient outcome for Ed Rosenthal, but also helped take what was a bad thing, the, the arrest, the prosecution, the conviction of Ed Rosenthal, and turn it into something that was good for the movement. And I think that's something that everybody uh, who was involved in that process, from the uh, you know standing on the street sign to doing the press conference conferences uh, to sitting there in the courtroom that day with Ed for sentencing should be very, very, very proud of uh, because that's the kind of uh, uh, history of resistance that makes a difference. So even if somebody has to be prosecuted, uh, we can stand up and turn that prosecution into, uh, I guess, what uh, the president calls here in Washington, D.C., a teaching moment. And so uh, that is the kind of uh, opportunity that we can make out of those challenges. Uh, by the way, Ed did have a successful appeal. And as soon as his appeal was successful, he was uh, charged again and convicted again. And uh, the courts went back and said, well, sure, he's been convicted, but there's no need to sentence him because he already served one day in federal prison. So he's, he's all good. And so I'm happy to report that Ed is out there uh, being as loud and uh, boisterous as he ever was for the cause of medical cannabis. In fact, when you see Ed speak in the future, um, I want you to look out for what we call Ed Red. We saw a lot of this in the trial. Ed Red is the color his face turns when he's shouting. That's Ed Red, and there's plenty of Ed Red to go around because he's not in federal prison. So, so look for those opportunities and take advantage of them, and you can help make uh, a difference like we did that day with, that, with the jury revolt and the, uh, the subsequent media. So those are some stories of resistance, uh, of, of ways that uh, this movement has fought back and is fighting back for medical cannabis all through these years. Thank you for being a part of that.